Hey, thank you so much for uh, watching another episode of uh, Less Than Me Success Stories. Uh, we're glad to hear have you here. Glad you joined us. I uh, want to ask you to take a moment and uh, share this, like it, subscribe it, whatever you got to do. Just help us uh, to get this uh, out there. Uh, we really do feel like this channel can uh, really help people, especially uh, starting their journey, but also anyone in the middle of their journey as well. Uh, yeah, so we just want to just get it out to everybody. And we really appreciate you guys uh, doing that and uh, helping uh, us do that as well. Uh, I am your host tonight, Scott. And uh, I do have a co-host, and we'll kind of get into that here in a second. Uh, our, so, Less of Me Success Stories was born from the desire of both uh, myself and my soon-to-be-announced co-host uh, to share inspirational stories of healing from, uh, from our friends across the internet. We have success healing, uh, uh, healing our bodies both mentally and physically through eating a range of low-carb diets. Uh, and you could tell I'm a fluent, fluent reader. Uh, we are also passionate uh, about sharing this message uh, and hope to uh, hope for those to uh, just embarking, just starting their journey on this uh, low carb journey and community that, uh, you know, just to help them with the support and maybe the questions that they have uh, and to just to help guide them through it. Because I know there's a lot of questions in the very beginning of this, especially. Uh, we encourage interactions through this chat and uh, just ask your questions. I'll be monitoring it. and. You have questions for me. I have questions for our guests. Just throw them out there, uh, and then just uh, just help others on their their pathway with this uh, journey of low carb eating. Uh, as a reminder, neither of us nor our guests are medical professionals, nor do we try to pretend like we are. We are uh, not offering medical uh, advice, uh, so please consult your medical team before attempting any interventions. So, with that said. My guest is also the co-host of the show, uh, and you. so you've seen her, if you've ever tuned in, you've already seen her before. Uh, she is an awesome person. I've been so lucky and fortunate to become, with, become friends with her and her husband, and uh, this, this, this uh, community has really brought uh, some great people in my lives, and I'm beyond blessed and grateful and fortunate to call this person a friend. So with that said, Robin Dobbins, how are you this evening? I'm great, Scott. How are you? I'm doing good, and that was the least smooth reading I think I've ever done. So, congratulations for being part of that. <laughs> you know what? What is this episode? This is our fourth episode, so I think we're okay for uh, hitting some bumps along the way. I believe that we have great fans, and they will be kind and gracious to us for, as we as we learn and grow in this space so i think we're good I, I agree i agree people that know me know to set the bar low and uh <laughs> we're, we're good from there so you have an awesome uh you have a really interesting story uh your journey uh and i've always so what really intrigues me with yours and i'm not going to step on it too much but what really what intrigues me about your stories i've always just assumed this way of eating is just a, a physical thing but it goes way beyond that uh so again, I'm not going to step on anything. Uh, please uh, start off. Uh, tell us kind of how you got into this and where you are and just give us a, a story behind your journey here, please. Sure. So I'm going to start with when I started to change my diet, but then we'll go back and forth in time a, a little bit because it all kind of intertwines. But in 2017, um, I was turning 40 and I went to the doctor to have my blood work checked because at 40 years old, they start checking for things. And of course, when I went to the doctor and he came back and said, your cholesterol is high and we need to put you on a statin. So this is where I have to backtrack a little bit. Before this, probably about a year before, my husband was listening to Adam Carolla and he heard Vinny Tortorich uh, on the Carolla show. And so he was trying this new thing called NSNG, no sugars, no grains. And I was not on board with this, but he was talking about it. And I had this little thing in my head that was like, statins aren't something that I need to be on. So I didn't know anything about it. I just knew from those conversations that, I'd, that I didn't want to be on statins. 
and that there was probably something that I could do about it and that would happen if I changed my diet. So really with very little information because I myself wasn't listening to these podcasts, I was just getting it filtered through Matt. I um, said to my doctor, can I please have six months? No, I think I said three months. Can I have three months to change my diet? And I was like, am I gonna die? Is this thing so bad that I'm gonna die? Or can I have these three months without medication to change my diet? And he, for whatever reason, just a normal, regular, everyday doctor said, sure, go ahead. Let's see what you can do. So that starts my NSNG journey is that I am just desperately trying not to be put on statins. I don't know anything about them, but I just don't want to. And the reason why I don't want to is because I'm already heavily medicated. Years before I was diagnosed as bipolar and I lean very heavily towards depression and I have OC. So I'm already very medicated. It's very challenging to take a lot of medications and I just didn't want to add another one. So we started, and this was actually very helpful for Matt as well because I was not on board with it. So he just slipped off the wagon and we were just eating regular by this point. So that's what I did. I just decided to, to go into it and we were an SNG. This is very simple in that I cut out sugars and I cut out grains. I didn't try to do anything else. I just tried to cut out sugars and cut out grains. And then I started listening to his podcast, Fitness Confidential. And every time he had a luminary on that had a book, I went to the library and checked out the book and read the book. And I just started filling my brain with information and just kept going. So fast forward, I go back to the doctor, we do the blood work and the doctor's like, wow, whatever you're doing, it's working. Keep doing what you're doing and we don't need to put you on any medication. So that that's where that that was. I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm feeling great. At this point, probably when I went back to the doctor, I had lost probably like 25 pounds that I didn't even know I was carrying at the time. So I, I was feeling great. I was starting to go for walks. And, um, you know, like anytime I had a craving, I said, I'm, I'm not going to deal with this craving. I'm going to go for a walk. So I was walking quite a bit because when, when you first change your diet, you start craving stuff like mad. So I was like just redirecting that energy into something else that was positive. And by the time I'd come back, I'd drink some water and I'd be fine. Um, so, uh, you know, that's really where that started. As time went on, this was 2017, um, in December of that year, Matt actually lost his job. He, he was, um, uh, anyway, he lost his job. So he looked and looked and looked to stay. We were living in South Carolina at the time. And so he looked and looked and looked so that we wouldn't have to move. And it just turned out that he couldn't find work. And he's originally from Texas. So I just said, Hey, this is the sign you've always wanted to go back. Let's just go back to Texas. Of course, he applies for jobs and he gets one. Well, we didn't want the kids to miss out on school. My son was a scout at the time. Uh, he had all these summer camps planned. So Matt leaves and he moves to Texas. And I have two kids, a house that we're packing up and putting on the market. And, um, you know, I'm the, the mom, the dad, the bus driver, the cook, the financial person. I'm, I'm everything by myself, even though I'm like really sick and usually not able to function. So um, we get through that time apart and we move to Texas. And um, I just kind of realized that everything was like I was looking forward to that move. And in my life previously, with how sick I was, uh, how depressed I was, that I didn't look forward to many things at all. Um, I would really, quite literally, my children would, I would set an alarm to wake up to get my children ready for school. This is 
prior to changing my diet. I would set an alarm to, to get them, take them to school, go home, go back to sleep, set an alarm to wake up, to go get them off the school bus. That was my life. I was very much asleep all the time. So for me to go through a move across, first to, to do all this stuff by myself, then to move across the country and start something new and be excited about it and start looking forward to it was a really big deal. So of course, this is now 2018. By January of that year, I went to the doctor here and I was like, you know what? I'm on these medications. At the time, I was on a, two medications. I was on an antidepressant and an antipsychotic. My, <laughs> my prescription was actually being filled by my general practitioner in South Carolina because the psychiatrist um, offices that I was going to kept closing. So by this time, I've lost 50 pounds and I'm being just refilled on these medications. So I'm 50 pounds lighter. Nobody's asked me what I weigh and I'm taking an antipsychotic and an antidepressant. And really, quite literally, I can't stay awake if I want to. So I was like, I'm feeling really good, but I still have these medications. They're probably not even the correct dosage for me. I go to the new doctor and I let them know what I'm doing. And this again is just a regular old hospital doctor. And, and I said, I think I would like to, to try to titrate off of these medications. And she was on board with it. Um, and I don't know how many people she's ever titrated off of antidepressants, but she did for me. It was um, quite a long process, but we did we did titrate down and I have not been on an antipsychotic or an antidepressant since. That's, that's, that's like my very that's quick incredible. rundown. That's that in itself is incredible because um I, and I, I apologize if I, I, I harp on this because I just, I just find it fascinated, but the 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 mental health aspect of it. Um, I I had a good friend and a roommate that suffered basically from the exact same things. And I had seen him for years, just up and down, up and down, up and down. Oh, it's better. It's worse. It's better. It's worse. And I had never seen, even while medicated, a consistent uh, even keel. So the fact that you're noticing that you're feeling better and they wean you off of it and it stayed consistent is phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to me because, you know, we're just always told that uh, medication and pills are the, the, the answer to everything. But the fact that you're doing it with food is just so cool to me and that it seemed like it was a much smoother transition off of it than while someone was being medicated from what I've seen in my, my past. It's just such a cool story, I guess. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I never knew that was part of your journey until here relatively recently. I just thought the first time I met you, you were just Robin. I never, you know, then I saw you're heavier and I was like, what the heck? And then I saw, heard about the mental aspect of it and it's just so incredible. So it just tells you how much what we put into our body is greatly affecting who we are and how we are. So you know? I will reiterate that this is my story. Um, so it was, not, I mean, it's not easy to titrate off of medicine. In fact, it was quite a process and the entire family was involved. Um, so I won't, I won't say that that's easy. And I know a lot of people now that I'm kind of in the space, I know a lot of people who are going through it and they are you know, checking in with their doctors daily, weekly, whatever they need to do to check in, because it's, it depends on the medication. It depends on the strength of the medication. It depends on how many medications you're on. But yes, you're absolutely right. When I got my diagnosis of bipolar dis disorder, I, it was the way, the same way that I jumped into NSNG. I, I was starting to do some research and I, I was reading, actually I was reading some biographies of, of famous people who, who were bipolar. And I was like, all of this stuff resonates with me. This is what I think I, I am. And I went to my doctor and said, I think I'm bipolar. 
and we ask some questions and check some boxes and lo and behold, that's the diagnosis. And I was excited to get the diagnosis. I was so happy because I knew that I'm going to be medicated and everything is going to be better because we know what I have. We know what's wrong. We know what the medications are and I'm going to take them and everything's going to be great. And I can enjoy my children because honestly, I'm a stay at home mom. I still am. I'm a stay at home mom. And I was sleeping through their lives or um, when I was awake, I was always very angry. So I was either asleep or angry and I was missing all that. So I was really hopeful that the medications that I was gonna be put on were going to be helpful. But it turns out that, um, no, they, they also make me sleepy. You know, they, so it, it took off the edge of the anger um, because I was asleep all the time. And then I would just have like two or three hours of angry and then I would get be asleep asleep again. So to your point with your friend, these medications, even though that's the, the standard of care, and that's how everyone gets treated. I don't know if you could ask a single person who's going through it, if they actually ever felt like they were well. Mm. It is just, mm. it's not really wellness. It's more, it's more just like survival, like basic survival. And when, and that's even, um, you know, like I often describe myself as just kind of being propped up in the corner and watching life go by. I was able to exist, but I wasn't able to really participate in life. It was all just happening. You know, there's like scenes in movies where there's somebody standing still and everything zipping by. That was my life all the time. I've, I've said before, you know, and um, I think this coming from different standpoints, but I said before, um, I was a spectator in my own life, you know, watching everyone live it. And it sounds like exactly what you were going through. It's tough. It's 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 tough while you're going through it and you're also recognizing it. And it's really tough after you get through it and you real, realize how much you're missing. Uh, yeah. And, and I try not to live with any regret because I only knew what I knew. Um, I knew that. Uh, when I was younger, like when I was in high school, I really felt the urge to kill myself. I, I didn't think I need to exist. Um, the first diagnosis of, of mental health disorder that I ever had was postpartum depression after my son was born. And at that time, you know, they were asking, did I want to kill myself or did I want to kill my child? And no, I didn't want to, but you know, these thoughts are passing through my head that I can't control. It's a very hard fight to know, like, you know, fundamentally, the, the difference between, I wasn't so far gone, I guess I knew fu fundamentally the difference between what was the right thing and what wasn't the right thing, but I had to fight that all the time. So it was a very exhausting time in my life to, to be going through all of those things. Man, that's, yeah, that's tough to wreck. I and mean, no, even when you recognize it or not, it's just, it's, that's tough, that's brutal. I mean, it's just a horrible, way to live in your head, you know? Um, yikes. Okay, so I do have some questions coming if you're ready for some questions. Sure, I feel like I okay. just like blew through that. So, you know, we can no. go back and whatever, but yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, um, so yeah, do a double duty. I wanna make sure I don't lose any of these here. So uh, for those that might not have seen the last episode, we have a question from Jen Mendica, who was a great, great episode if I do say so myself. So. Any of you that have not seen it, go back and check it out. So her question is, uh, what is your workout routine like and how has that changed since you started NSNG? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I was not a very active person, obviously, because I was asleep all the time. So I didn't really do much. Um, I was in scouts. So whenever we went camping, I went camping, but it wasn't much. So um, then, like I said, when I started NSNG, it was really about focusing on changing how I ate. So working out was not even really part of my worldview at the time. I just wanted to, to like I was imagining little scrub brushes inside of my heart, scrubbing out all of the, uh, you know, clogged up stuff that was all building up in there. And if I could focus on getting those scrub brushes to clean it out, then that's what I was going to do. Aside from 
whenever I had a craving, I would go for a walk. It wasn't like I was going for a 10 mile walk or anything like that. I just get out of my house and away from my kitchen and away from the cabinets and all of the stuff that I might want to snack on. And I would go for a walk. When we moved to Texas, um, I started, I had to go for walks because we were living in an apartment. So then I was going to a park and so those walks did start getting longer and I was going twice a day. So those would be either two or four mile walks, depending on the wind. The wind is crazy here. So depending on the wind um, would be how long I would, would go for the walks. But I would, so Daisy, my dog and I became walking buddies. And um, so walking has always been something, well, since really since starting in 2017, that's always been something that I did. Then um, after we moved here and when I was titrating off the medication, I needed to do some things to help me with my days. I had to make some rules for myself and the rules were no naps. I wasn't allowed to take, I wouldn't allow myself to take naps. So while I was titrating off, I, I wouldn't, and I still don't, I think I can count on one hand how many times I've taken a nap since 2017 because I slept. I've already done, I've already done all the sleeping I need to do. Now I need to be awake. So, um, uh, and then I needed to incorporate, I needed to learn how to sleep at night. And I wanted to start incorporating something to do with this energy that I had. So I started doing practicing yoga um, and I still to this day practice yoga and I wake up in the morning and I roll out of bed and I land on the mat and I do 20 minutes of yoga and that's how I start my day every day. Um, so uh, that's that was the next that was the next step. I really did not do much more than walking and a daily yoga practice for probably, I don't know, maybe two years. I, I have some notes written down. I'm just going to see when I started. Um, right. Yeah, I, I do know. This is funny because in, uh, in early, either late 2019 or early 2020, Dr. Ben Bocchicchio was on the Fitness Com uh, Confidential podcast. And I was like, I'm buying his book. And I bought his book, 15 Minutes to Fitness, read it, and bought a total gym online right before the world shut down. Because after the world shut down, you couldn't find them anywhere. Uh, so 2020 is when I actually started a workout strength training routine. So I started NSNG in 2017. So we're talking three years later. I, I actually did a dedicated strength training routine. And I did that 15 minutes to fitness program that is written in his book. Um, and it worked really, really well. I mean, I, I have little pictures of me with my, uh, my arm all up, like my little baby muscles that I, I grew all by myself. And so I was really proud of myself. As time went on, I finally sucked it up and um, had a consult with Vinny. I say sucked it up because both my husband and my son had had a consult with him. And I was just kind of trying to do what they told he told them to do, which turned out really wasn't right for me. So I had a consult and he formed a program for me, which I did up until uh, this past June, <laughs> where I now am doing an, an Olympic weight training class. If you want to see what I do, I post a video almost every day on my Instagram account. Uh, I am learning how to do Olympic lift. So I'm learning how to, to snatch and I'm learning how to clean and jerk. And um, it's very technical, but that's where I am now. So it was quite an evolution. And I am going to try to do, because that's a three day a week thing that I'm doing. So I am now trying to figure out what I'm going to do on the off days. So I row. I, in 2020, we got a rower. It's right there behind me. So on the, the days that I'm not, at the gym, I row and I might do like a light ab exercise or um, apparently I need to get stronger lats. So I need to do some lat exercises. So I will do some things at home, but nothing is very um, organized yet. I'm working on that. So 
Yes, I see your post every single morning of, of what workouts you're doing. And uh, and we'll re we'll retouch this at the end of the uh, show, but I want you to be able to tell people right now while it's fresh in my mind, um, what socials and what is where do they find you so they could see these crazy workouts you're doing every day? <laughs> I am on Instagram, X, and Facebook, and all of them are Robin R. Dobbins. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question, but I'm going to butt in really quick because uh, you are one of the people that uh, helped me to kind of clean up my way of NSNG because you talked earlier about how it's no sugar, it's no grains, and that's how I was for the longest time. And then the first time we met, uh, we and some other NSNG friends went and had a nice uh, prime rib dinner, and you bust out your own little tiny Redmond's salt. And I was like, oh man, this this lady means business. So now in knowing you, uh, you, you research and you dig into cleaning up, I, I would call it cleaning up or uh, low carb. Uh, you know, I know you're really into like the no seed oils and everything like that. Uh, so in the beginning, you said, you know, no sugar, no grains. How long did it take you to start digging in uh, to the information of like what seed oils do? And did you see any benefits from that as well? I started reading the books that were presented by the luminaries immediately and just started soaking in all of this information. Uh, you know, Dr. Kate Shanahan's book, uh, of Deep Nutrition, and she talks about the seed oil thing. And I was like, whoa, I am not doing that. I'm not doing that anymore. Um, and I, I just, I, once you start getting the information, it's like, why were we ever doing it any other way in the first place? So I did start really digging in. But the process, you know, I think people think that I'm like up here on this level, like nobody's ever going to get to where Robin is because she's like crazy. Um, but it's not. It, I have other issues. So first of all, I know that if I eat carbohydrates or possibly a high oxalate food. I don't know, I'm not gonna do the experiment again. Um, but I know that uh, my depression will come back. And in fact, I was just talking to Matt about it today. This time last year, I was still clawing out of a depression. I never went back on medication, but I was aware that I was in a depression uh, because I had done an experiment. So I guess I'll talk about that for a quick second. I was, um, I was, with Dr. Tro, he was my doctor at the time. And so it turns out, and oddly enough, ironically enough, that my cholesterol levels shot very high um, as I became more lean. And then of course, if you know who Dave Feldman is and you follow him, he's working on this lean mass hyper responder uh, information. I mean, it's a, it's a ton of research that's going on out there. And, um, he actually has worked with Dr. Tro, and Dr. Tro was working with me. And at the time where there wasn't too much information out there, so we knew that if you drop carbohydrate uh, and your cholesterol levels shoot up, then the the theory would be that if you add some carbohydrate, your your cholesterol levels will go down. So we did an experiment together, and that was called the sweet potato experiment, where I ate a sweet potato every day with no fat and with nothing else. So my first meal of the day was a sweet potato every day. This went on in a various stages and I've talked about it before. So you can find me on other <laughs> on other uh, podcasts talking about it if you want. I'll just give the brief scenario. It turns out that when I did this for about six months, my depression came back and it came back hard. My big trigger is when I wake up in the morning, I'll say to myself, I can't wait to go back to bed. Also, my family, they all know that if I'm showing signs that they need to say something, they might not say something to me, but my kids would say something to my husband and then my husband would say something to me. So I was aware that the carbohydrates cause my depression. Also, I have another health condition. I'm autoimmune. I have Hashimoto's. 
So I have to keep myself very, I have to, no matter what, at baseline, I have to be gluten-free or I will trigger those antibodies, which are still very high. I know I hear people all the time who have healed their Hashimoto's or put it into remission because they eat a ketogenic diet. Mine is not, mine's still ridiculous. So um, I have to keep it at base, at the very baseline, I have to stay gluten-free. I know what these things will do to me if I eat them. So it is a it is very much a daily decision to not eat something that's going to cause me symptoms. Do I want to eat some things? My daughter, she wants to be a baker. She wants to own a bakery when she graduates high school. She wants to go to business school and own a bakery. So there's always baked goods in my house. Do I want to taste these things that she's created? Absolutely. Can I? No. And thank goodness she's a loving person because she understands why I, I can't taste her creations. Uh, otherwise, I think that would be hard. If she, thought, if she thought that love was me eating her food, then um, she would feel very unloved because I don't eat her food. So uh, that's why I have to stick so very strict. I am now this evolution of this way of eating. I am now almost entirely carnivore. I can tell you the things that I don't eat that are meat, that I eat that aren't meat. And that's an avocado, onion, and tomato. That's basically it. And because of my Hashimoto's right now, I am currently a month and a half into a no dairy experiment. So I did get my blood drawn. I had my antibodies checked. They're high. I am not eating dairy for three months. And I hope that if I get my, when I get my blood drawn after the three months are up, that we see some trending downwards of the numbers. And if that's the case, dairy is gone. And, and to me, it's, the, I just have to abstain from it. The symptoms are so horrible that I don't want to live them again. And it's not worth it to me. And, you know, I've made, I've made my peace with that. There's a grieving process involved for sure. There were definitely times that I was like, it's a birthday party. I have to have the cake. I'm at a wedding. It's bad luck if I don't eat the cake. I mean, I was making excuses just like everybody else. But where I am in my journey now is my health is paramount to everything else. I can't be any good to anyone around me if I'm not feeling my best. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we can all test, like, you know, just just that one live a little. For some of us, you have it, and it's 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 really not that good. It's really not worth it. Um, so, yeah, you you identify it pretty easily and um, know that you don't need it. Um, yeah, and I have it. Like, this is. I know you you have a question. Um, I, I I talk about this because I think it's funny. <laughs> In the summertime, you know, we'd say, oh, you can have a, a fruit in season. My daughter loves watermelon. We went to the farmer's market, got a fresh watermelon, a Texas watermelon. It's, I mean, it's from down the street. It was grown right here. And we cut it and eat it. And it was amazing. And then the next time I went to the farmer's market, it was a watermelon and a cantaloupe. Mm. And then it was a watermelon, a cantaloupe, and honeydew. And then it was a watermelon, two cantaloupes, and two honeydew. Then, and all of a sudden, we realized, that, like, I'm, I'm serious. In June, we started getting watermelon. By September, I was eating ice cream every night. That's how that happened. That's how fast that happens. And it started innocently with an in-season melon and it turned into ice cream every night. So I know that that's what's going to happen. And when that happened, like... I, I, I'll have a com completely, uh, like two years ago, I had like a completely NSMG Christmas. I didn't eat anything that was bad for any of my meals, but the desserts came out and I was like, well, I'll just have one. Well, one is like one for breakfast, one for dessert after lunch, one for dessert after dinner, one for before bed. The next thing I know in January, after a, a, you know, a week of eating pie for, for breakfast, I had neuropathy in my hands and my feet. 
And I was oh, like, geez. that that was, I think, a re response from my Hashis. And it, and it scared me because I couldn't feel my hands or my feet. So I, I just don't want those things. Like, I want to be able to feel my hands and feet. Like, that's a pretty... That's the <laughs> right. thing that I want, right? So it, it keeps me honest because I know I know the consequences. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a slippery slope. I mean, you know, you justify a little bit, then you justify a little bit more. Then it's once a day. Then it's once a little bit every meal, and then before you know it, it's just full blown, and you just really kind of gone off the deep end. So we have a question from our friend uh, Carolyn R. Uh, she says you're amazing. Uh, when did you first uh, notice your symptoms of bipolar and uh, OC? And uh, so, well, that's a two-part question. We'll start with that. So uh, it's hard to pinpoint a date uh, or a year of when I first started noticing it. Um, in high school, I know that I was not a happy person. Um, my my freshman year of high school, all of my friends just one day said, we don't want to be your friend anymore. And they dropped me. And that was it. I was by myself. Um, still very emotional about that to this day. Um, so that's when things really started for me as far as, you know, I don't have any self-worth. I'm not valuable. Nobody wants me. Um, but I just hit it. My sister knew. And my sister, just she's three years older than me, so she kind of grabbed me and t pulled me into her friend group, but she was a senior, so she graduated. And I spent basically three years with very few people who were my friends. Uh, and uh, I went off to college and had a great time <laughs> made and made friends, but I still just never got over that feeling that I have no value. I'm not not um, smarter than anyone there. Like everybody's smarter than me. Everybody has more opportunity than me. Everybody's doing better than me. And I just couldn't shake that. Um, but I never really, I never really told anybody about it. So like I said, in 2007, when my son was born, that's when my husband noticed it. I've, uh, I would get to a point where I'd get so just messed up, like my brain couldn't function and I couldn't speak. So we would get into arguments and he would talk and I write, I would write and he would read it and I would write and he would read it. Like, uh, so he would speak and I, but I couldn't speak back. And th that's when he noticed it. And I was writing notes like, I don't want to be here anymore. I have an infant. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to die. I just, I, I don't want to do this anymore. These are types of notes that I'm writing to myself and just kind of leaving all over the house. Uh, so, you know, that's when things really started going. I started, and now I went to my doctor and the doctor was like, oh, you have postpartum depression. Here's some antidepressants. And they sent me on my way. There was no follow-up appointments. There was no counseling appointments. There was no anything. It was just refill, 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 refill. Um, the, I a couple years later was pregnant with my daughter. I tried to get off the medication while I was pregnant with her, and I just said I just don't feel like I'm winning this fight. So I actually went back on it while I was pregnant with her, and I stayed on them until we had moved again. That what we lived in Pennsylvania, we moved to South Carolina. Um, I didn't have a doctor at the time. I just stopped. I just, I just stopped. I just stopped caring. So I went for, I'm not sure exactly how many years I went without any medication at all. So I would probably say she was born in 2009, probably 2011. Let's just guesstimate 2011. That's when I was like, these symptoms are really bad. Like I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a pleasant person. Like I am definitely not who I want to be. And I don't know how to make myself be who I want to be. Cause I'm just, I'm just struggling through life. And that's when I started like going to the library and picking up books about depression, about bipolar disorder, just biographies by people who had it. And, uh, and then that's when, and so again, I just go to my general practitioner and I, and I say to them, I think I'm bipolar. He asked me like five questions and I'm like, yeah, sure. To all of the questions. So he sends me on my merry way with 
uh, prescriptions for uh, an antipsychotic and an antidepressant. So that starts that journey. Then I bounced around from psychiatrist, 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 uh, psychologist. Did I say it wrong? One of them is the doctor that gives meds and one of them is the one that does it. I always say it backwards. Anyway, I, I kept bouncing around. Each, each doctor gave me a different medication every time. Nothing ever worked. So you hear the, the statement of um, uh, treatment resistant. It's, it's treatment resistant. Well, no, we just haven't figured out the correct combination and we keep trying all these different combinations and we don't stick with one of them long enough to know if any of them was gonna work. That's That was the life that I was leading then. I don't know if that answered the question, but um, I can't even remember what I was feeling. Like I feel, I'm so different now than when I was, that I don't even remember what I was feeling when I was feeling at my lowest. No, that's tough. That me knowing you, I it it just breaks my heart knowing that you had to go through all that. Um, I do, I I appreciate it, and I know everyone else appreciates you being willing to share that. Um, no way possible could it be easy rehashing all that. Um, if you don't mind answering this on the second part of it, do you feel like what you were eating, the foods you were eating, contributed to that? To all that you were dealing with. <laughs> well, now, yeah, I do. At the time, I had no idea. So I can't go back and change that. But yes, I, um, my diet was really like what the kids weren't eating. I would eat. Um, I love Pop-Tarts. That's going to cause a stir. I loved Pop-Tarts. <laughs> I loved Hot Pockets. Um, I, I more often than not was eating like some frozen dinner of some sort, um, for lunch. I did always cook dinner, um, but a lot of pasta based, uh, foods, uh, hamburger helpers. Ugh, come on now. My kids still ask for hamburger helper. I'm like, I'll make it my way and I'm, I'll make you a little side of pasta. You can mix it in, but otherwise, uh, it's going to be just meat <laughs> with a little bit of sauce in it and some cheese. Yeah. So, um, but I can't imagine, uh, honestly, how could it not have been what I was eating if I'm so, if I'm thriving so well now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you, I, I don't know if this is, would be something you can answer or not, but do you feel like you feel better now the way you're eating off of medicine or do you feel like, or is it the same? Was it, was how the, how the results were with medication and being off of medication with a different way of eating? Are the results roughly the same or is one better than the other or does that make sense yeah it does and okay. this is a million times better that's not quantifiable um, okay. so, um on medication like i said i just felt like i was propped up i was able to be out of bed but i was really just being propped up and placed in different situations and the racing i, I still had racing thoughts but then my body was just slower. So I couldn't, I, I couldn't like get that stuff out. So like I would write, <laughs> I would like mm. write these long emails to people with like every which way scenario because I couldn't articulate them, but I could, I could write them down. If I could take the time to slow down and write down, I would. So it'd be this real long, crazy email. And uh, it just, it just wasn't, it, it, no, this is by far better. I can, and I feel like I've healed a lot in the really in the I know I know I said I had that bout of depression because of the sweet potato experiment. But you know, at the time um is when we had started doing that clubhouse that this is now kind of taking the place of. Um and when I started those clubhouses, it would be like two days of preparation, a full day, you know, the day of it would be I would just like sit and pace and like anxiety is a, a crazy thing. So I, I would be so anxious. I would just pace around the house and then go to the bathroom like a thousand times. I would not, I would on purpose not even drink any water, but somehow I still had something to, to get rid of. And then I would, after it was over, I was so amped up. I would just immediately just walk out the door and go for a walk. I'd locked my house myself out of the house a couple of times because I just walked out and, locked, and closed the door behind me. And then it would take another day to calm my nerves 
just for it all start over again for the next one and now i'm like doing interviews all the time and people are setting up things with me and i'm doing them and i'm allowed i'm able to share my story and it's like this, that anxiety went away and i noticed it where i healed that when i go on trips because when i fly i'm a very nervous flyer so I was doing the same thing. I'd be like timing when I could go to the bathroom so that I could go before I got on the plane and then wait for it to be in the air before I tried to go again. And it was just this whole like deal. And I, we just went to Maryland for Thanksgiving and it was no problem. It was just easy peasy. Like I was totally relaxed. And so it's amazing, like these little things that you, if you keep doing them, it's the same as why people, why you might want to be a, a Ironman athlete because you're putting yourself through all of these stressors so that when things happen, you can, you can handle them. I had no capacity for handling any stressors whatsoever. So this process of changing how I eat and doing this healing is still an ongoing process. I'm still dealing with all of these things. And it's just, it's kind of just getting easier as time is going on. That's that's incredible because you know it also makes me laugh is doing this show with you. There are so many times like we're communicating back and forth, and I always say to myself, "Man, Robin is the most organized person I know. This is incredible. I need to get my crap together." So it's it's just uh it's pretty incredible where you were to how you are. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I got another question for you from Jen uh, that I just lost. There we go. Um, have you struggled with consistently working out? And if so, what have you done to become more consistent? I absolutely have struggled with being consistent. Um, my way of dealing with it was once, once I got a workout plan and that was at first that 15 minutes to fitness. And then, you know, the plan that I worked out after my consult, I actually typed up a chart and it's uh one one page is set is two weeks and it has all the exercises on it it has the amount of sets that i need to do on it. it i can fill in how much weight i was holding in my hand while i was doing each of those exercises and i have a binder that i've kept all these charts in and it's important to me to fill out my chart so um, when I was coming out of this depression that I was in from the sweet potato, that was another indicator that I was not well. I stopped all of my workouts entirely. I stopped yoga, I st except for walking the dog. I, I stopped yoga. I stopped my weight training. And um, that was how I got myself on, even though I still didn't feel like I had pulled myself completely out of my depression. I printed out my sheets. I put them in front of me and I was like, every day at this time, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and I'm going to do this workout. It also works better for me to get it done in the morning. If I wait, I, I often just skip it. So I try to get it done in the morning. That helps me stay consistent. But writing it down, doing it in the morning, that's how I, I stayed on. I struggled with this concept of the infiniteness of having to keep going. And what I've realized is that you really have to let go of this concept of an end point. That goes for, for dieting, that goes for weight training. There's no end point. You're always just trying to be the best you that you can be. And you just gotta keep pushing yourself every single day. I like that, that, that makes total sense. Yeah, there, yeah. Uh, just making your making you think there's an end point I, almost like prepares you there's a quitting time and we can't have that mindset so i i do enjoy that um with i have a question personally with you adding weight training uh to your to your workout routine and everything i desperately need to get weight training in the ball and i'm not really doing a good job focusing on weight training could you tell me or could you share with us after you start a weight training benefits you might have seen uh, from that, uh, whatever it may be, like any weird things that you noticed, any like did it help with weight loss or like the lean muscle mass thing? I, I got all kinds of questions with that. 
<laughs> well, you know, they keep saying that lean muscle mass is the uh, indicator of longevity. So, okay, I want I want to work on lean muscle mass. Um, I was never like a exercise person. I was never a cardio holic. You know, we talk about women, they love to do cardio and they never want to do strength training. And I was like, well, I don't really like cardio. So let's go for the strength training bit. But um, honestly, you know, and I used to say this all the time and I, it still applies, but people who um, get that, like I hit my goal weight and now I'm still losing weight. Oh my God, what's going to happen? And I would always tell them that you're not going to lose weight so much that you cease to exist. However, if you want to gain weight in a healthy manner, do a strength training. You need to gain muscle. So that's what, um, that's actually what happened to me. I, um, I don't usually actually really talk about my weight loss. So all in all, I've lost 50 pounds. I, 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 I then lost more than that. And I was under a hundred pounds. And if I saw myself in a picture, my clothes were just hanging off of me. There was no shape to my figure whatsoever. I just was flat. <laughs> so, um, I was like, I gotta do something about this. And I started the you know, weight training and I actually gained probably 15 pounds total, actually more than that because how much I lost my goal weight where I want it to be, I lost probably 10 pounds less than what, where I want it to be. And I gained that plus another five. Um, and, and I'm pleased with it. None of my clothing has changed in that amount of time. I'm still in the same size clothing. However, apparently when you do a lot of squats, your thighs get really big. So I didn't have to go up a pant size. The waist wasn't the problem. I couldn't get them up over my thighs and they're really not all that big, but I'm not trying to be that um, ultra muscly person, but I did want to look like I was fit. And a lot of that motivation came from, well, I needed to gain some healthy weight was was one of the reasons but the other one was i i was vanity i wanted i've done all of this work to feel better so i needed my body to match the the work that my my brain and my food intake had had done makes sense i i i, I still to this day have a problem focusing on uh the weight loss numbers myself but like it's incredible when i hear people like you talk about oh i and the same size, but I'm X amount of pounds heavier, which I understand it's possible. Obviously it's possible. My brain doesn't work that way. So I need to re refocus that and not worry so much about on the, the scale aspect of it. So yeah, and I that. can't even remember the last time I stepped on the scale, but I do understand and I and I and I feel this. My starting weight is a lot of people's goal weight. I was not, I mean I was obviously it's bigger. I'm only five foot one. So that weight did show. Um, so, you know, a 50 pound weight loss for, for me on my frame was pretty significant. However, I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that my story is, as far as that storyline, the weight loss storyline is concerned, is very different than a lot of other people who are on this journey. So I, I get it. I, I'm, a, I'm quite the opposite. I'm a neurotic person with the scale because I, I, I don't know why. I weigh myself in the morning. I weigh myself when I get home from work. I weigh myself when I get out of the shower and I weigh myself before I go to bed. Yeah, I'm so, coming to your house and I'm taking your scale. It, it needs a time. My, my wife gives me looks and also just flat out calls me out. Like, what are you expecting? So, <laughs> yeah, I do do focus more like on that. But um okay so we're, we're we're pretty much getting to the very end of the show and as you probably actually know this question better than me uh so the consistent question we're trying to ask everybody at the end is if uh what do you have what words of wisdom what advice uh what tips or tricks do you have for people just starting this journey uh, that has helped you and yours my my standard answer to this question is typically to stay consistent i know a lot of people they have all of these goals and 
they will start a lifestyle change, whatever that lifestyle change is. So let's just say somebody's going to be keto. They'll start tracking their macros and they'll start asking questions and then their numbers aren't going down as quickly as so-and-so's numbers are. So you can't compare yourself to that other person because you're on your own journey. And then, but that's not the bad part. The bad part would be, well, it kind of is bad, but the bad part is then they think, well, I'm going to add this. I'm going to, I'm going to start fasting. I'm going to fast but they're not going to do the research into the fasting. They're just going to start doing it. And then that's not working fast enough because so-and-so over there lost this much weight when they started fasting. So I'm going to start reducing my meal size. And, and they never give themselves time. It's just one thing after another thing after another thing that they pile on. And they never give themselves enough time to settle in. My story is that I've spent a full year just learning how to eat MSNG before I even tried anything else. And I, and it was completely successful. Did I refine as I went on? I'm six years in. Yeah, absolutely. I refined as I went on because as I went on, I started noticing that I had other ailments that I wanted to try to heal. But it's, it wasn't a quick process and I stuck to what I started with. I think we've heard stick with the dance that you brought that stick with the girl you brought to the prom or, or whatever that is that that that's very true it doesn't have to be complicated you stick with what you started with and give it at minimum three months and if it's still not working out or then then make a change just make one subtle change and then stick with that for three months and and it's gonna work you just gotta be patient I love it, but also, uh, was that a personal attack towards me, Miss Miss Robin? Uh, because, because uh, <laughs> you know, I've been kind of focusing on more tracking and stuff, and uh, uh, I think we've had this conversation with me, you and your husband, and I feel I feel attacked here. <laughs> well, you shouldn't, because I I I did not specifically think of you. However, the shoe fits. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It absolutely does. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you're not alone. If that's what you're doing, you're not alone. Everybody does that. And I didn't come from diet mentality. That was not my world. So, uh, you know, I, that's where I see it the most is the people who were chronic dieters and they want to just try this, they want this, they want this, they want this, and they never just settle into something. And they're always focusing on a goal weight. So they're always standing on a scale all the time. I don't know who does that, but um, um, just. Rewind a couple minutes, you'll find out. Um, so, so uh, you know, it it does not have to be more than. And I say this with all all sincerity. It's it's simple, and the reason why it's so complicated is because it's so simple. We just want to make it harder. We just want to add different things to it trying to speed it up you, we got our bodies have to heal at the rate that they were going to heal we don't we don't have any control over that but we can give it the the building blocks that it needs and that's food i was just listening to a podcast with um it's it's new it just dropped today i think um georgia Ede, dr georgia Ede is being interviewed by dr sean baker so look for that it's on youtube uh she says and this is so true every single cell in our body is made out of the food that we eat. Mm. Every single cell mm. is made out of the food that we eat. So why don't we feed it the right things and why don't we allow them the time to rebuild themselves? Absolutely, that's that's excellent, I love that. Um, I'll definitely watch that one also. Uh, so we're- I'll we're post it tomorrow because I'm going to watch the rest of it while I'm rowing and I always post what I watch while I row. So it'll be, I'll put the link on X tomorrow. Perfect. Everyone will look for that. Appreciate that. So we're about, uh, about to our time. Where could people, again, we've brought it up, but I want to bring it up again because we're wrapping it up. Where could people find you and uh, what was socials and everything like that? So I am on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on X. Twitter, whatever you want to call it. All of my handles are Robin R. Dobbins. Um, come, come find me. Uh, I'm, I'm so, 
I have received so much from this lifestyle that all I want to do is help other people. I just, I, I want, I want other people to get the same benefits, but if, you know, you don't have to have a, a mental health disorder or, uh, um, but anything that you're going through. I, be, I firmly believed that it can be healed or at least made better uh, by changing the diet. And I want that for everyone. I want everyone to have that opportunity. And if you can't do it by yourself, I will do it. As Jen knows, I will come to your house and I will slap it out of your hand if that's what you need. If that's, if that's the tough love you need, I can be that person. But I can be whoever, if you need somebody to reach out to, please reach out to me. That was perfectly said. And folks, that's kind of why we do this channel also is uh, both Robin and my passion for this way of eating and just uh, not just the passion, but the the facts that we know what it can do and the healing powers and properties it has. Folks, it can change your life in so many aspects in so many ways. So that's, that's why we do this, um, just to spread that news. So this was also a bonus episode. We typically do this every other Thursday. Uh, we squeeze this one in between one of the other episodes. We have some great guests coming up. We've booked pretty well in advance and have some pretty awesome people coming up, if I do say so myself as well. Uh, so with that, please, again, share, subscribe, let other people know about this. Uh, let this be a community thing where we get to, you know just bounce ideas off each other and ask questions and just build each other up in this way of eating. So with that, on behalf of myself and the awesome Robin Dobbins, we thank you for joining and we'll catch you guys next time.